So, Galatians is in the New Testament, and it's the Apostle Paul's letter to the people of Galatia. So we're going to be looking at a wonderful epistle and a very controversial epistle. In fact, it's what some would consider one of the most controversial books in the entire Bible. And so it's going to be exciting. I'm sure it's going to invoke questions and dialogue and maybe even debate. So let's go ahead and before we open the book, let's open our hearts for a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you that for the, for the sake of the Son, you've set us free. We thank you, Lord, that we have freedom in you and that you wrote these things for our learning and our knowledge. And so, amen. I think I am. Yeah, is it on? Did you see it? Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and start. Let's do a little bit of, let's go ahead and talk about, I want you to remember context is everything. This was an ancient letter written in an ancient time. And you need to know that letters are expensive. They're not cheap. They're, they, you, there's no post office. There's no email. There's no postcards. So if you're writing a letter, it's important. So Paul is writing this letter, and, and who's he writing it to? He's writing it to Galatia. Now, when we think of Galatia, we think that it's a particular city, but it's not. It's a province. Galatia is a set of cities. It is, think of like a state or an area. So the, the main cities in Galatia were uh, Lystra, Derby, and Iconium, and Paul was the apostle of that area. He planted those churches. So these are his churches that he planted and then commissioned elders and, and, and got them filled with the Holy Spirit to be overseers over these areas. And then Paul, in true apostolic pattern, went to the next city to plant churches. And so the, the context here is after Paul left, certain men came in. And started teaching things that were contrary to what Paul taught. And so this is the most angry you're going to see Paul in all of the New Testament. He is frustrated. He is mad. He is, it is white, hot heat. So it's a, it's an, this is not a boring epistle. If you think, notice Galatians is rarely anyone's ever f favorite epistle. It, uh, a lot of people have trouble with it because Paul is personal in it. He, uh, he talks about ex confronting Peter. He talks to the Galatians, the Judaizers who came in to try to pervert the gospel. He goes, if you guys are going to get circumcised, go ahead and, 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 and finish that. Like, go ahead and chop the whole thing off. Like, that's kind of that, literally, the language that Paul has. It's a very... A turbulent, uh, controversial, and disruptive epistle. Epistle. It's pointed. It's emotional, and so you have to. You have to ask yourself why. Why is Paul so uh, disturbed? Can't we all just get along and be tactful and tolerant? And can't we all just get together and sing kumbaya? Why is Paul so mad? And the reason is is because the integrity of the gospel. The reason is, is because the gospel was at stake. And you always defend what you love. Now, I, I, in witnessing with people, sometimes for hours, they'll sit there and they'll defend their sin. They'll defend their rebellion towards God. And at the end of the conversation, I always say the same thing. I look at them and I go, hey, for the last hour and a half, we've been talking. And you've been defending sin and your such and such lifestyle. And I've been defending living pure and righteousness before God and holiness. And I always say the same line. You always defend what you love. So Paul here is defending what he loves. He's defending these churches, these people, these cities that he loves. And he's defending the sake of the gospel. 
So this is the occasion here. There are certain men that creep in and they begin teaching contrary to what Paul has taught. Paul taught liberty in the Son and freedom, both for Jew and for Gentile. He, he taught the, they call him the apostle of grace. But now men are creeping in after he left and they're saying, hey, Paul didn't give you the whole story. It's a gospel of addition. Anytime people add to the gospel, be careful. Anytime people say, you need this book, or you need this revelation, or you need this teaching. You look at all the cults, they're all the same. Whether it's the, the New World Translation for the Jehovah Witnesses, you need this book, you need this Book of Mormon, you need this Christian Science by Mary, Mary Baker Eddy. It's always an addition to the gospel. You can add to the gospel, or you can take away from the gospel. But Paul is trying to protect these believers. And so I, I want us to, I want this book to be turbulent. I don't why, you know, this is not a uh, simmer down, be quiet, let's all get together book. Galatians has actually spurred the great movements of God in history. It was when John Wesley heard the text of Galatians that he was converted and his heart was strange, strangely warmed. Uh, Martin Luther and his great reformation to save the church from a works mentality and, and that were saved by works, Martin Luther called Galatians his wife. It was his epistle. He literally said, no, it's mine, which is an interesting way of talking about a book in the Bible. He, he, he nicknamed it after his wife. And so John Bunyan uh, considered, considered an exposition on Galatians the greatest thing ever written. And besides the Bible, of course. So I want us to, to think about these men. That, that, notice that these men aren't out planting churches. These men aren't out building their own small group. And so they're having to take over works that were already established. Always be watchful of that. Always be mindful of that. One of the marks of a wolf is they have no life in themselves. So they can only pervert. They can only uh, deconstruct. They can never create. So they don't have that life-giving power within themselves. But they can sure uh, tank a church. They can sure subvert a church, pervert a church. So be mindful of men who take over. Because they're saying this. They're saying, Paul hasn't told you the whole story. Let me add to it. And that's what these men did. They added to the grace of God the 613 laws of Moses. And it started with a, a very particular act, the mark of the Jews, which is circumcision. They started saying to these Gentiles, oh yes, you've received faith in Christ, that's wonderful. And now the mark of faith is circumcision. And so they're saying, hey, you got to be circumcised. You, you want to be saved? Well, saved people receive this mark of circumcision, and this is how you come into the faith. And Paul is saying, no. Remember, his, his method was to the Gentiles. From his very beginning, God called him to be an apostle to the Gentiles. And so now we're in this situation where the question is, what does a believer have to do? What does a believer have to do? How? So the great themes are circumcision and salvation, liberty and license, the spirit, the flesh, the works of the law, the works of the spirit. These are the great themes of Galatians. Before we get started. So let's go ahead and get, and start, get started. Chapter 1 verse 1. Paul an apostle. Not from men nor through men. But through Jesus Christ and God the Father. Who raised him from the dead. Now I, I, what I love here is that it shows that the Father. Raised Jesus from the dead. You need to understand that there's a great. Uh, what I call a trinity of trinities regarding the resurrection. 
all three members of, of the Godhead take part in the resurrection of Jesus. This is the, this is the scripture in which reference that the Father rose Jesus from the dead. But Jesus, remember, he says what? No man takes my life. I lay it down and I have power to rise it up. When he was speaking of the good shepherd. This is Jesus has the authority to rise himself from the dead. Paul goes on to tell us that the same spirit which rose Christ from the dead now quickens our mortal bodies. So the father, the son and the spirit all had a role in the resurrection of Jesus. So don't allow someone to begin in, in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, don't allow them to try to separate the work of the Father and the work of the Son and the work of the Spirit. They're all involved in the resurrection of Jesus. And all the brethren who are with me, verse 2, grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present age. Amen. Verse four, I like to key in on that the purpose of what Christ came to do, the purpose of his gift towards us, he gave himself for our sins so that he might what? Deliver us. The gospel leads to the deliverance. If there's no deliverance, Paul is not preaching here a sinning gospel. Paul is not preaching here a, a defeated gospel, but the purpose of Christ coming to give him our, his self in the gospel was that we would be delivered from this present age and that this is the will of God. According to the will of God our and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Verse 6, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. Now, not, not to get controversial, but it says here that these people are now turning to a different gospel, that they're departing from the grace of Christ. Now, some people think that's not even possible. Some people think you can't depart from the grace of Christ. You can't, you can't f go to a different gospel. That once you're in, you're always in. Paul starts the epistle in the first chapter saying, you guys are departing from the gospel. You, you are being called into a, a, different, a different gospel. And so he, he's warning them. And, and remember, you warn because you love. You warn because things are at stake. One of the roles as ministers and pastors is our job is to warn. And, and, and that's not just the, the pastor's role. The, Paul says, him we preach, warning every man, teaching every man. Warning is part of what we do. If we, if we truly love people, we will warn. I marvel that you're turning away so soon from him. Who called you in the grace of Christ. Remember, your faith is not in a system of belief, but it's in a person, Jesus. You're turning away from him who called you to the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another. But there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. So if people are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ, it's our responsibility to preserve and protect the gospel but even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what you have than what we have preached let him be accursed this is important many people uh, unfortunate have had subsequent wave of revelation even uh, angelic visitations and it has led to incredible deception in the world Muhammad received uh, a revelation from a, a supposed angel in a cave, which led to the great deception of Islam. It was another message. Joseph Smith was in a garden in New York alone, and he saw two angelic beings. And that led to the great deception. Now there's 22 million people on the earth today that are deceived by Mormonism. If we are any other... Uh, angel preach any other gospel than what you have heard let him be a curse see this is not a uh, god loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life message this is a turbulent 
angry, fiery message. This is the most fiery you're ever going to see the Apostle Paul. He comes straight out of the gate. Notice when, when, when Paul would write letters to people, do you know how he'd usually start? Even when Paul had issues with, like, like, like for instance, when he had issues with the church of Corinth. He, the church of Corinth is in trouble. You know, they're, they're sleeping with everybody and they're, they're speaking in tongues the entire worship service. And some of them are not believing in the resurrection. And some people are with Peter and some people are with Paul. And there's this great divisions in the church and there's all kinds of trouble. But how does Paul start the letter? I write to you, you, I'm grateful that you guys have every spiritual gift and blessing. Like that's, that's how he starts off Corinthians. How does he start off Galatians? Hey, there's another gospel. You guys are getting bewitched. It's a, it's a, there's no, uh, how are you guys doing? There's no, uh, yeah, it's kind of like that. It's, it's a, it's a, it is a appointed letter. And, and he goes on to say it again. Verse 9. As we have said before, so now I say again. If anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. Have you ever thought that? That these people come knock on your doors. I'm here to give you the testimony of Joseph Smith. And, the, and, and you're like, you are accursed. That doesn't ooh, win friends and influence people. You think that would go over well? But this is what Paul is saying. Verse 10. For, I, for do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I still pleased men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. You have to settle that right now in your heart. Are you living for the approval of men? Or for the approval of God? Are you a, if you are a servant of men, you cannot be a servant of Christ. If you're living to please others, you cannot be a servant of Christ. Verse 11. But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached to me is not according to man. For I neither, neither received it from man nor was taught, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. Paul is basing what he received on that great Revelation that he got on the road to Damascus, that Jesus was alive and that Paul was thoroughly, actively, zealously engaged in trying to uproot everything that Jesus had started. Remember, when Saul of Tarsus received the revelation of Jesus Christ, he was breathing out death threats to the church. He had in his hand. A, a, a written authority from the Sanhedrin that he was allowed to bring Christians, followers of Jesus, followers of the way, back to Jerusalem in chains. So he is act like he is actively fighting against the church, and then he receives the revelation of who Jesus is. Verse thirteen. For you have heard of my former contact in Jerusalem, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. What a testimony that the one who tried to destroy is now the greatest builder of the church. How many churches did he destroy? How many churches did he build? You see, there's this juxtaposition. There's this what 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 the enemy meant for evil. God was able to redeem and turn for good. That his, his, his zeal to, de to destroy the work led to his zeal to, to, to create and, and propagate and spread the work of God. And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the tradition of my fathers. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me. Once again, the divine union, Christ in, in you, the hope of go the gospel. That me and my father will come and make our home in you. To reveal his son in me, verse 16, that I might preach him among the Gentiles. 
I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood, nor did I go to Jerusalem to those who apostles before me, but I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Now, notice here that when Paul, uh, Paul is not pushing aside the need for Christian fellowship or the need for, for Christian uh, older Christians to mentor and guide. That's not what he's saying. Remember, who did he have from the very beginning? This is a great question. Who did he have from the very beginning? So I think there's going to be a line for Paul in heaven, right? Everyone's going to want to meet Paul and talk to him. You know who I'm going to run straight to? Ananias. He gets no love. He gets no credit. They're like, hey, no one focuses on Ananias. Like, basically, it would be, in our culture, if, if he was still alive, it would be like, Kyle, I want you to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to Osama bin Laden. Like, I want you to, to find this man and preach to him. And you'd be like, oh, I think I'll pass. I think I'll find someone who's uh, dangerous, who, who's dangerous to Christians. This is that. Paul, was Saul of Tarsus was that man. He was number one enemy of the church. And Ananias heard from the Lord so clearly that yet he even went and was faithful. I mean, can you imagine that interaction? Like, are you going to kill me now? <laughs> like, you're, you, you, are, you are imprisoning all the Christians, but the Lord has told me to go talk to you. And then he, he counsels Paul, Saul at that moment. He counsels him. He, he tells him, to arise, call on the name of the Lord, have your sins washed away, be baptized. And then he lays hands on him. And it was Ananias' hands that were laid on Saul of Tarsus and which Saul of Tarsus was filled with the Holy Spirit. And he was healed and his eyes saw. So it's incredible. So I'm going to Ananias. I want to talk to Ananias what it was like in those early moments. So what... He's, he's not pushing aside community. He's not pushing aside fellowship. He had that with Ananias. But he did have to go and spend time with the Lord alone. And he went to the deserts of Arabia and spent time with the Lord. Just personal time and intimacy with God before the ministry started. And an incredible, uh, I think it's like a juxtaposition. Remember that Moses went into the wilderness, into the desert, and the law was brought forth. And now Saul is going to the desert and going to the same wilderness, and now grace is being brought forth. God always tells the story before the story. And so it's kind of like they went to the desert and they received the law. Now he went to the desert and they re he received grace. Verse 18, then after years, I went to Jerusalem to see Peter and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Now, that's another sermon in itself. But Paul and James have a great relationship. A lot of people try to put them at odds. But because of the epistle of Paul and the epistle of James. But they are actually are, are great contemporaries and great friends. And Paul always mentions James as an authority and as, as an elder and, 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 and in good, and in good uh, recognition of him. Now, verse 20. Now concerning the things which I write to you, indeed before God, I do not lie. Afterwards, I went into the regions of Syria and Sicily. And I was unknown by face to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. But they were hearing only he who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith, faith which he once tried to destroy. And they glorify God in me. So they saw transformation in Saul of Tarsus. That he who became, who was their enemy has now become an apostle of grace. Chapter 2. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and also took Titus with me. And I went up by revelation and communicated to them that the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but private, privately to those who were of reputation, lest by any means I might run or had run in vain. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, 
was compelled to be circumcised. See, now we're, now we're moving into the issue. So we've talked about the author. We've talked about the audience. Now we're running into the issue. And the issue of the church of Galatia is circumcision. The Judaizers who have crept in are now commanding that if you want to be saved, you have to have the mark of Abraham. You have to receive circumcision. And Paul is against this because he's basically making the argument, once you start the law, you have to continue in the law. That you, It's not just one command, it's all of the commands. It's not just one law, it's the 613 laws of Moses. Remember, it is in the Galatians epistle where Paul teaches us that he who is guilty of one of the law, it, breaking one law is breaking all of the law. So let's go ahead and continue here. And I think we're at verse uh, 4 of Galatians chapter 2. Verse, let's go ahead and start. And this occurred because of false brethren secretly brought in who came by stealth to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ, that they might bring us into bondage. Once again, strong controversial language to whom we did not yield submission even for an hour that the truth, truth of the gospel might continue with you. He's saying we never listened to those people. And that's, that's, that's the right behavior. I see sometimes there's this tendency in new believers and they always want to debate the cults. Close the door. Don't engage them. Look for faithful, available, and teachable individuals. Don't waste all of your time with, with, with false teachers. And I, I wish someone would have told me that because I spent incalculable amounts of hours doing that. And I wish someone would have said, hey, close the door. I would have probably had 10 or 15 more disciples if I would have closed the door. Okay? Personal thing right there. Anybody, what verse are we on? Eight? Seven? Six. But from those who seem to be something, whatever they were, it makes no difference to me. For God shows personal favoritism to no man. For those who seem to be something added nothing to me. But on the contrary, when they saw that the gospel for the uncircumcised had been committed to me as the gospel for the circumcised was to Peter, for he who worked effectively in Peter for the apostleship to the circumcised also worked effectively in me towards the Gentiles. He's speaking of the Holy Spirit working in Peter and the Holy Spirit working in Paul. And he's making a distinction. Remember, Paul was an apostle to the Gentiles. And Peter primarily dealt with the churches in Jerusalem. So different specific ministries. And when, and when James, Peter and John, who seem to be pillars, perceived the grace that has been given to me, they gave me and Barnabas... The right hand of fellowship that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. They desired only that we should remember the poor, the very thing which I was eager to do. So what we have here is we have ministerial distinctions between apostolic elders. We have the apostles of Jerusalem and then we have Saul, Paul, the apostle, and they're now... Uh, Focusing on two distinct different people groups. The, the Jewish disciples, uh, Peter, James, and John, are focusing on the church of Jerusalem and the corresponding Jewish communities. And Paul is going to the Gentiles. Remember, this was the number one controversy in the early church, is the relationship in the churches between Jews and Gentiles. This was the issue. So much so that they literally... So one point in the early Christian history had to gather everyone together. It was such an issue that the first Christian council in which they gathered all the elders from all the cities was on this issue. Jews and Gentiles. And what do the Gentiles have to do in order to 
be a Christian or what, what, what is noble and right towards their obligation towards God. So this is not just an, like sometimes we talk about Bible issues and doctrines and, and we, we, we don't understand this was the issue. This was the most important thing in the early church was the relationship of, between Jew and Gentile and the laws of Moses. So this is the point of the epistle. So verse 11 Now, when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face. Remember, Antioch is in Galatia. I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And when the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with them, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, If you, being a Jew, live in the manner of the Gentiles and not as a Jew, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not, highlight, underline this, a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. This is the heart of the epistle of, Gal of Galatians. This is the heart of the epistle. This was the scriptures which led to the greatest transformation and the reformation of the church. Many years later, the entire Catholic church is entrenched, and still to this day, entrenched in a works mentality that we are saved by our works, that we are saved by what we do. But Paul's letter to the Galatians is the silver bullet which kills the, ve which kills the werewolf of works. It is the answer that we're saved by faith, that we're justified by, by faith in Christ. Now remember, we're not saved by our works. We're saved to our works. It's the grace of God which teaches us to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. That it's God's grace and, and our faith in Him is the start of a wonderful relationship in which we work out our salvation by fear and trembling. But we don't work to our salvation. We work from our salvation. And this is the argument that Paul's making, which was the sole tenet of the Reformation, which brought the church out uh, of legalism and bondage uh, of the law into liberty in Christ. Verse 17. But, but if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners... Is Christ, therefore, a minister of sin? The answer there is certainly not. Just to make sure that we're all clear, as ministers of, of, of the gospel, we're not to be ministers of sin. If we're ministers of Christ, we're not to be ministers of sin. Certainly not. For if I build again those things which are destroyed, I will make myself a transgressor. Paul's saying, don't go back into the law. Don't, uh, don't try to follow all the laws of Moses to be right with God. For although, the law for although the law died to the law that I might live to God, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Once again, Paul puts the emphasis on the divine indwelling. Christ in you, the hope of glory. For although the law died to the law that I might live to God, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. That's so important that we know this. That the good in us is Christ. That the, that, that the love and the fellowship that is in our hearts and, and for one another, that comes from God. That that that. Spirit that is in us that comes from God. That's, that's the good. That's what we trust. That's the basis of our fellowship is Christ and other people. 
That's the basis of our love. This is what Paul's talking about. I have been crucified with Christ. He goes on to say in another epistle that our life is hid with Christ and God. And so he's making the argument that it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I live now, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That should give us an assurance in our hearts that God loved us and gave himself for us. And so from that position of knowing that you're loved and knowing that Jesus died for you, I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. If righteousness comes by the things that we do, then Christ died in vain. O oh, foolish Galatians. Who has bewitched you? Once again, strong language. Who has bewitched you? Someone sees Paul saying, somebody's put a spell on you. Somebody is moving you away from the simplicity of faith and the grace of the gospel. And, and you'll see that sometimes, you, you, if you've been in a ministry and fighting for souls long enough, sometimes people are, are just in this stupor that's like their eyes are blinded. And you're like, it's right there. <laughs> Look at, read it again. Read it out loud. Please, what is wrong with you? Like, you'll be with that with certain people. Like, because Paul says that, some, that the God of this age has blinded their eyes sometimes. So Paul's making this argument. The foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that, sh that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the spirit by the works of the law? Or by the hearing of faith. Are you so foolish? Once again, strong language. Having begun. I want to stop right there. He's making such strong. There's a timidity in the body of Christ that needs to go. There's a. If we looked at our two virtues, it would be tolerance and tact. Jesus was not tolerant and Jesus was not tactful. In any way whatsoever. I mean, they, don't, well, they didn't want to crucify Mr. Rogers. There should be a, a boldness and a zeal for the things of God. When, when, the, when the gospel is in danger, there, sh there should be a, a, a righteousness that riles up in us to try to preserve. Because it should be based out of love. In the same way, if anybody endangered your family, you guys would be like, you know, hold me down. I'm coming. In the same way that there should be a, a zeal for the things of God to preserve and to protect and, 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 to, and to be a help. And this is Paul's heart here. Did you receive the spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish having begun in the spirit? You are now being made perfect by the flesh. Have you suffered so many things in, in, in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Now, I believe he's getting very personal right there. Because where was Paul stoned? Does anybody remember? Where was Paul stoned? They stoned him and left him for dead. No, it was in Galatia. So he, he's not, there's blood on this epistle. He, he paid a price for these people. He was stoned and left for dead. So now you can understand. No, 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 no. This isn't just a church to me. This is a place where I, they, you know, they stoned me. It has a little bit more significance now. Now you understand why there's a little bit more heat in the words. 
Therefore, he who supplies the spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, that he was thought of as righteous. Abraham believed God and it was accounted. That word for accounted means thought of as thought of as righteous. Therefore, knowing that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham and the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached this. The gospel to Abraham beforehand. Now that is an incredible statement that we don't have time to get into. That literally that the gospel was preached to Abraham beforehand saying in you all the nations shall be blessed. Said, said that then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. Now let's get into the technical part. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all the things which are written of the book of the law to do. This is why it's so important that Paul is saying, Hey, don't, don't go into the law. If, if you go into the law and break the law, you're going to be under the curse of the law. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident for the just shall live by faith. Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. Christ, verse 13, very important. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. That the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So much there. That Christ received the curse of the law. He, would, he was received that, that we might receive the faith that is in Christ. Verse 14, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. How do we receive the promise of the Spirit? Through faith. Faith. That's the answer. We receive the Spirit by faith. Brethren, I speak in the matter of men. It was only a man's covenant, yet if it is confirmed, no one knows it or adds to it. Now to Abraham and his seed, speaking of Christ, were the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds, as many, but as of one. He's speaking here that, that the, mark of the, the mark of the Abrahamic people was the circumcision. And he's saying the whole point of, of the mark was to the preservation of the promise until his seed comes, which is ultimately Christ. So Paul is making that when Christ comes, this nullifies the need for the mark of circumcision. That when Christ comes, it's all been fulfilled. And so this is Paul's whole point. That you're continuing in a process no longer needed. He's saying that seed was Christ. That's verse 16. Verse 17. And this I say that the law which was 430 years later cannot annul the covenant that was confirmed before God in Christ. That it should make the promise of no effect. For if the inheritance is of the law and is no longer promised, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. That he's making the juxtaposition between law and promise. Verse 19. What purpose then does the law serve? It was added because of transgressions. Underline that. That's very important to understand that the purpose of the law was because of transgressions. When you break the big laws, you get the small laws. How many of you have ever been teaching? And it, have you ever been a teacher and been in a teaching environment? Whenever you're in an environment like in a classroom, or you, most of you, some of you are fathers in the room with your children, you start off with a couple of laws. Oh, and then all of a sudden, you, no, 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 no forks. And the outlets. That's a law now. 
like Jude just got a new law because he and Liam were arguing about what seat they were going to sit in. And I had been in the car for 10 minutes waiting on, that was more like 20 minutes waiting on my wife to get in the car. We've all been there. And, and so I'm sitting in the car and I can see Liam in the back seat. And he and Liam is making noise, so I automatically assume that Jude is in the car. But Jude got out of the car quietly and snuck around because he wanted to sit on Liam's side. And I put the car, when Beth got in the car, so I've been in the car for 20 minutes. My boys had already been in the car for 20 minutes. I've been waiting on my wife. I can see Liam in the back seat. He's making noise. He's playing on the switch and all that stuff. So I think both boys are in the car. I put the car in reverse and I back it up and all of a sudden I see a flash of yellow. Thank God he was wearing a bright yellow and I'm like, <gasps> and I literally, um, I didn't, I didn't hit him. He didn't get hit, but he, it was like, he was like tapping on the car. You're going to leave me. I'm like, Ugh. so now there's a new law in the house. Because of transgression, there's a new Volkmer law that both boys get in the same door and they never fight about seats again. And if I hear anything about seats or who sits where, there's going to be what I call blue-butted baboons. That's the phrase we use in our house. That, Do you want me to turn into you, to you a blue-butted baboon? They know what that means. But now why? That law is based out of love. When you break the law, you get the small laws. There was only one law in the garden. One law turned to 613. The law was given because of transgression. It was added because of transgression. Till the seed should come to which the promises were made, and it was appointed through angels by the hand of the mediator. Now, a mediator does not mediate for one only, but God is one. Is the law then again the promises of God? Certainly not. For if there had been a law given by which could have been given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. He's saying that the law does not bring forth life. It's the law, Paul begins to make the argument later, is our tutor. It shows us our need for Christ. But the scriptures have confined all under sin. That the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Now a lot of people, they get mad at me. They think because of my particular issues regarding certain doctrines, they think that I don't think that men are, are sinners. The answer is the Bible confines all under sin. It says it right there, that all are under sin, that the promise of faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But it is this, sinners are sinners when they sin, that when they transgress the law, they become transgressors. And so the, the, the responsibility of the sin is always on the individual. That's what I believe. Before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law, kept for the faith which would afterwards be revealed. Therefore, the law was also our tutor. That means our, 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 our teacher. Our, you never had tutoring. To, s simple instruction to bring about maturity. That the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ. The purpose of the law was to bring us to Christ. That we might be justified once again by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Please understand that. You are what? Sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Now what does it mean to put on Christ? Anyone? Does anyone know what it means to put on Christ? Christ's nope. That's an Augustinian interpretation. The phrase put on is actually a Greek theater, theater word. It literally means to act in 
or to, to act as the role of. So on Sunday morning, my intro, I'm going to put on John the Baptist. I'm going to act like him. I'm going to talk like him. I'm going to actually be preaching and I'm going to have an intro and I'm going to act like John the Baptist for a while and hopefully everybody doesn't run out. But, but this, so when Paul says, put on Christ, that when we are baptized into the newness of life, we're to now look like Jesus, talk like Jesus, and act like Jesus. And so that, that's what Paul is saying here. There is neither Jew nor Greek, neither is there slave nor free. This goes into your question earlier this morning, Sonia, about the difference between Jew and Gentile and the heirs and the promise. He's saying they are all one in Christ Jesus. Now, to us, we've heard this, but this is a revolutionary concept in the early church for, in, a, in a culture that was so divided. Remember, the rabbis would, oh, boys, get away. There's Gentiles over there. And they would hurry you through the market. There was very limited interaction. So that for Paul to say, these are all one in Christ. It's revolutionary. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now, wait a second. This would, don't you think this would create some frustration in Jewish people who, who, who were prideful of their pedigree? That could trace their genealogy and their lineage all the way back to Moses, all the way back to Abraham? And so now Paul's beginning to say what? That you are Abraham's seed if you are in Christ? Woo! Do you think he might have got some frustration here in the synagogues? That he can see this, this African standing right here, this Arab standing right here, and saying these guys are now heirs of Abraham if they are in Christ? That would have been controversial. That, that would have got Paul in a lot of trouble. But that's okay. David Paulson says the only evidence of the Holy Ghost in your life is trouble. Trouble. Chapter 4. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave though he is master of all, but is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the Father. Even so, when we were children, we're in the bondage under the elements of the world, but when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. People sometimes get... Get on to Paul because he doesn't mention the virgin birth. And it's such a strong particular Christian doctrine. Why doesn't he mention it? But I think this is a wonderful reference to it as well. He doesn't mention the miraculous nature of the virgin birth. But he does mention the human nature. That Jesus was born a human under, uh, from a woman under the law. Speaking of the, the Mosaic law. To redeem those who are under the law. That we might receive the adoption as sons. Once again. The adoption of sons is mentioned. Verse 6. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit on His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. If the Spirit wants you to understand one thing, it's sonship. Sonship. The Holy Spirit wants you to understand sonship. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through Christ. He's bringing nobility back to man. He's saying you're not. So I've seen so many Christians, and honestly, I was stuck in that for a while. I was okay being God's slave, but I found it hard to be his son. I was okay to just do, do what I'm told to do. And I... And, 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 you know, I was, I was grateful, I was saved, but he led me from slave to son. And if the Holy Spirit wants you to understand one thing, it's sonship. So we sometimes go through that. We go from slave to son until heir. Now, what's an heir? 
Exactly. And we need to move into what the inheritance of the saints is. Verse 8. But then indeed when you did not know God, you served those things which by nature are not God's. But now after you have known God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements to which you desire again to be in bondage? You observe days and months and seasons and years. I'm afraid for you, lest I have labored for you in vain. So what he's saying is that you're beginning to look at the Sabbath and the festivals and all the laws of Moses, and you're neglecting the simplicity that was in the gospel. And he's saying, I'm worried lest I've labored in vain. Once again, does this jive with the once secure, always secure construct? It doesn't jive. Paul's saying, I'm worried that I've labored in vain here. I'm worried that you've departed from the simplicity that is in faith in Christ. Brethren, I urge you to become like me, for I became like you, and, I have not in, and you have not injured me at all. You know that because of my physical infirmity, I preached the gospel to you at the first. And my trial, which, which, which was in my flesh, you did not despise or reject, but you received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. Paul's not saying that he was Christ. He was saying that, that when these people first heard the message, they were so uh, enamored by him, they thought he was an angel or they thought he was Jesus. What then was the blessing you enjoyed? For I bear you witness that if possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. Have I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? So this is what's going on. You're like, what is happening here? Paul is actually referring to a physical infirmity that I believe he had. He had an issue with his eyes, that what, which I believe is what he described as the thorn in the flesh. He prayed three times that it would be removed, but the Lord said, my grace was sufficient. Now you begin to see the humility here. He heals others, but he himself needs to be healed. That this is an interesting dichotomy. That he he's able to heal others, but he himself needs to be healed. He himself is in walking. Now you're going to see this infirmity of having having needing help. Dependency there. Remember. They said that they would give him their own eyes if they could. Remember one of his epistles, he says what? I write to you now with my own hand. See which large letters I write to you. So now we're getting to beginning to get in this imagery that Paul had an issue with his eyes. And yet he still preached the gospel even in physical infirmity. That gives us no absolute, no excuse for us. The thousands and thousands of miles that Paul traveled on dusty roads, yet with a physical infirmity. See, now we're getting to get an image of this man and who he was. That he didn't let anything hold him back. And he was able, he healed others and yet needed healing himself. But the grace was sufficient. This is why they call him the apostle of grace. Verse 17, or verse 16. Have I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Approval of man or approval of God? Approval of man or approval of God? If you tell the truth, sometimes people will view you as their enemy. Verse 17. They zealously court, court you, but for no good. Yes, they want to exclude you, that, that you may be zealous for them. But it is good to be zealous in a good thing always, and not only when I am present with you. My little children, for whom I labor and birth again until Christ is formed in you. I would like to be present with you now and to change my tone, for I have doubts about you. Paul is wanting them to be formed in Christ, to trust in Jesus alone, to be justified by faith, and not to rely on the works of the law. Verse 21, tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, 
the one by a bondwoman and the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh. And he of the free woman was through the promise. Once again, flesh and promise is a great juxtaposition. Which, which things are symbolic for there are two covenants. The one from Sinai, which give birth to bondage, which is Hagar. And for this Hagar is Mount, excuse me, is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is and in bondage with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. So he's giving this juxtaposition between Hagar and Sarah. Between the child of bondage and the child of promise. Between the two mountains. Rejoice, O barren, who do not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor. For the desolate has many more children than she who has a husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac, were as children of promise. But as he who was born according to the flesh then persecuted him, who was born according to the spirit, even so as now is. Nevertheless, what does the scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be with the heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but under the free. He's going a long pedigree of history here, but he's showing this old story of two women with two children, two mindsets. Remember, Hagar, Abraham tried to do it himself. He didn't trust the promises of God. He tried to, by his own works of hand, fulfill the promise. You remember the story? And Ishmael came. By the work, Abraham says, oh, God's promised this, but I have to be the fulfillment of that promise. I have to make it happen. Sarah has not given a child, so I'm going to take this woman. You see this? It's trying to do it yourself. The two. And Paul, once again, this imagery, this story of the two women and the two births, he's basically uh, uh, saying again, reiterating the truth. By the works of the hand, no flesh is justified. You have to trust the children. Of promise rather than the children of the bondwoman. You see? This is the imagery that he's giving that they would have understood. Now into chapter 5. This is where it gets good. Exciting. Freedom. Stand fast therefore in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. And do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if, if you being circumcised... Christ will profit you nothing. Wow. If, if, if you go along with these Judaizers, Christ profits you nothing. If you listen to these outsiders that have come in and who try to add to the gospel, you, you, Christ is nothing to you. That is an incredibly strong statement. That is not a let's all get along. You're either in or out. There's a severity there. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made you free. And do not not be entangled again by the yoke of bondage. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. All of the law you must keep. You have been estranged from Christ You who attempt to be justified by the law. You have fallen from grace. For we through the Spirit eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything. But faith working through love. That's that's the statement right there. Now, now, Now these Judaizers, what do you think they would have done? They're upset. I'll tell you what they've done. But wait a second, Paul. Wait a second, Paul. Didn't you, didn't you circumcise Timothy? Didn't Paul circumcise Timothy? He did. So they would have looked. That's what they always do. They try to look at something which subverts your whole teaching. But why? We have to look at motivation. Why? To reach. 
He did it as an evangelism tactic, not as a salvation. So the reason so, uh, Paul circumcised Timothy was to, to get into the Jewish circles to evangelize in synagogue, which was Paul's custom. And so it was an evangelistic tactic, same the same way sometimes missionaries, they go to different countries and they take on the garb and the dress of the people they're trying to reach. It was an evangelism tactic. It was not a sal sal salvation issue. But see how they're going to twist. They're going to twist. Well, Paul did this to Timothy. And so now they have a platform for, for the 613 laws of Moses. Verse 7. You ran well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion does not come from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Leaven is always negative. It's always symbolic of sin in the Bible. I have confidence in you. So what does that say? A little bit. A little bit of sin. A little bit of leaven will leaven the whole lump. I have confidence in you in the Lord that you have no other mind. But he who troubles you, let his bear his judgment, whoever he is. And I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why do I still suffer persecution? Remember, Paul's persecution was primarily from the religious. It was from the religious Jews who were trying to kill him and who were persecuting him from city to city. He would get into a new place and he would start churches and everything would be going great. And from the last place that he was just at, the religious people would finally get there and then they would come and they would try to disrupt everything that he did. So much so that seven men, I believe it was seven men, took a vow to kill Paul. There's one time Paul, in the middle of his Bible study, has to be led out the back window and led down the side of the building in a basket because people are trying to kill him. And it was the religious people. It's always the religious people who started to stop the movements of God. And I, brethren, if I preach Christ, if I preach still circumcision, why do I still suffer persecution? Then the offense of the cross has ceased. I could wish that those who trouble you would even cut themselves off. <laughs> uh, guys, you uh, understand what he just said there? Yeah, that's the old... Uh, <laughs> woo. Once again, this is a, uh, you know, a white-hot epistle. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. He's giving this imagery. He's dealing particularly with the issue of the church. They were biting and they were devouring one another. They were being too critical of one another. I say then, walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Now, he's going to give this great juxtaposition between the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. See, so remember, works, he, he, he's writing this whole epistle to say, hey, don't do works. And then he uses his imagery. Hey, you know what comes with works? And he gives into it. And then he talks about the fruit, which comes from abiding and trusting in Jesus. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousy, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, Envy, murder, drunkenness, revelry, and the like of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in the times past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, 
long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there is absolutely no law. And those who are in Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. I'll say that again. Those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us walk in the Spirit, not becoming conceited and not provoking one another or envying one another. Last chapter. Brethren, if any man is overtaken in a trespass, you who are spiritual, restore him in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself also, lest you be tempted. It's very important. How do we restore someone who's caught and entangled in sin? The Bible says with gentleness and humility. You know, if you ever come across an animal trapped in barbed wire, anybody ever come across? If you walk up on that animal and you just start jerking on that wire, he'll actually become more entangled. And so it's important that you do it slowly and gently. And sin has entangled many people. And we, and, and our, and our, and we are to restore them with gentleness and humility, with the mind that that could be us. Never with a high mind to saying, I can't believe you would do that. But with a, be careful lest we also fall. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he has deceived himself. But let each one examine his own work and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For each one shall bear his own load. Let him who has taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. You want to take up an offering? That's a joke, guys. Come on. Pay attention. Pay attention. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have an opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. See with what large letters I've written to you with my own hand. And as many as desire to make a good showing in the flesh, that they would compel you to be circumcised, only that they may not suffer, suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. That's so important. Paul says, don't, don't, don't make a good showing in the flesh. What these guys were doing, oh, I've gotten 13 people to be circumcised, and they were bragging about it. That's what it means. We have to be very careful of that when we're we're, we're talking about this numbers or all the things that God's doing. We don't want to make a good showing in the flesh. It's God that's doing the work. And he's saying, he's saying, if I'm compelling people to be circumcised, I I wouldn't suffer persecution. But he's saying the persecution comes from the cross of Christ. For not even those who are circumcised keep the law. That's an incredible indictment. He's saying you have the law, but you don't even keep the law. You you want them to be circumcised that that, that you may boast in your flesh. But God forbid... That I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I into the world. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. And as many as I walk according to this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. For now on, let no one trouble me. For I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. He's talking about all those laws, all of, all of that context of not following out the law. He's begging them. He's imploring them. He's beseeching them. And at the very end, he raises up the choice. He says, you have a choice. The cross or circumcision. He says, you have a choice. The cross of Jesus Christ, which God, 
was cursed so that you might be thought of as righteous, that you might be a son by faith, that you might be justified by grace. It's the cross or the works of the law. He, he, he leaves it as an option. He says, well, choose. He's putting that as the great ending to this epistle. And he talks about the new creation. And he says, nobody bother me. What is he saying? I've already chosen. I've already chosen the cross. Lord Jesus, we are challenged. We're challenged. Show us, Lord, areas in our life where we trusted in our own works and not in the sufficiency of your gospel. Show us areas of our flesh which are warring against our spirit that they might be crucified and that we might walk in faith and hope and righteousness in you. Lord, let us be more dependent on our intimacy with you, not trusting in works of righteousness, which we have done. But let us know of the sonship that your spirit speaks to our hearts this morning. Let us walk in that. Let us walk in the spirit and will not obey the lust of the flesh. Amen.